You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. 687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, Think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible, affordable, relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. 
takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. Hello, America. Welcome to the program. I am Rick Robinson, one half of the crew for The Jen and Rick Show. We're live right now on KLRNradio.com, where liberty and reason still reign. And we do this thing every Tuesday and Thursday night at 10 p.m.-ish Eastern, when the lady in front of us actually shuts things down in time. Now nah, I'm just playing. I'm, I'm honestly, notoriously the worst one for starting shows late, which is why it's fun to give other people a hard time, because they like to pick on me for starting my shows late, and then they run their shows long, and then I have an excuse for starting my show late. <laughs> All right. So anyway, we have lots of stuff to talk about tonight. Uh, most of which is actually, or one of the things I'd like to talk about is the fact that I have a certain co-host with a birthday tomorrow. And since we will not be live tomorrow, I just want to take a moment to say happy birthday now. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm super excited. It's finally old enough <laughs> to drink. You should go enjoy it. <laughs> Damn oh man, yeah, birthdays don't quite mean what they used to, do they? Who are you talking? My, th- I, when I'm, I'm old enough, we didn't even used to do birthdays. I mean, they used to just tie a rock around your neck, throw you in the water, and if you came up, you were good. I mean, dude, I'm like <laughs> old, but anyway, so yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, back in the day, I would be super excited that my birthday fell on a Friday night, and now I'm like, cool. Oh, I guess I'll stay up an hour later. <laughs> I'll have one more glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, and then you're good. Then you know you're like halfway into that extra hour that you were gonna stay up. And you're like, do I really want to stay up that other half hour? I've already had the extra glass of <laughs> well, wine. See, Maybe I should just go to yeah. bed. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, my problem is, and this is what people who kind of monitor my t- Twitter habits may not understand is. Um, first of all, I am naturally a night owl, so staying up late for me is not the same as staying up late for other people, but, um, I've got a kid also that doesn't sleep very well and he never has since the day he was born. Uh, there is something in his DNA. His, uh, grandmother says it's how his father was and he, uh, basically didn't start having good sleeping habits until he was in like, you know, real-time school first grade so yay i've got a couple more years but um we are periodically up in the night and so sometimes you see me on at like four or five a.m and then the other thing is that i have uh i work events so if i'm you know doing anything for an event uh i'm up until all hours of the night i don't know whenever loadout ends which can be 4 a.m it can be 6 a.m it might be 2 a.m if i'm lucky so i it's not like that crazy for me to be up late but when i'm at home and i don't have to be um i start to hit my limit about 12 30 or 1 and so on a birthday night i might be like yeah i'll watch that extra netflix episode and probably fall asleep anyways yeah, I, honestly, most of the time I'm an insomniac, so I have really weird sleep schedules anyway. Um, actually, since I've noticed, though, since we moved out to the country, I'm not as bad about staying up, like, super, super late now. Um, honestly, especially w- with this most recent time change, normally time, change, time changes don't affect me. I just, you know, 
usually I just keep on going. This one, I, and I think part of it's because when I get up to go to work, it's dark. By the time I get home from work, it's getting dark. And usually by about 8, 30, 9 o'clock, I'm actually starting to get sleepy. I don't know if that's because things are just a lot more peaceful and low-key out here, so I don't have nearly as much to stress about. Um, or if it's, you know, bills are paid, stomach's full. Uh, those yeah. th- those yeah. are kind of new sensations because when you build your own business, you know, you have a few good years and then, then things fall apart and suddenly it takes you five, six, seven, eight, nine years to recover. Um, so, I mean, you know, it could just be that I'm finally starting to normalize a bit again. As much as normal is a relative word for me. Um, but... So, I mean, I get it because, I mean, I've, I've, like, been on and been up and been, like, three in the morning. And I'm like, hey, Jen's on. And then I'll yeah. pop, pop in, like, a couple <laughs> nights later. And I'm like, oh, nobody's here. I'm going back to bed. <laughs> I know. I, I know who all the insomniacs are because of when I'm up. But also, you're like me and you just are, you know, you go, go, go. And you work hard. And I don't – um I'm not one of these people that needs nine or 10 hours every night to function well. In fact, uh, that's too much sleep for me and can start to uh, be bad news. It yeah, can that, make me overtired. Me. It can make my body hurt, um, you know, all those things. So, And I'm a really solid, like, six-hour person who likes to get, like, like five to six hours is okay for most of the time. And then I get a couple hours of, like, a couple of nights of eight hours in and I'm good to go unless I'm doing like a long event stretch. And then I'm just like, okay, 30 minute naps. That'll be good. (laughs) Yeah. See, that's kind of me. And I mean, like I said, part of it's because I I ran my own business for forever. And when my wife and my, my wife that I'm with now, when we were first starting out, one of the things that we really didn't want to do was put kids in daycare. So since I could basically (laughs) write my own schedule, I worked a lot of the night shifts at the job, at the gigs that paid. And then I did a lot of the office day shift day day work paper shuffle stuff from the house because I was the boss and nobody could tell me that I couldn't do that. Um, so, I mean, I was putting in average 19, 20, 23 hour days, getting a two or three hour nap here and there. So, I mean, I've gotten to the point where honestly, six hours is right about where I feel perfect. If I sleep any more than that, yeah. I start to feel like somebody ran me over with a truck, but then I'll get like these times where my sleep schedule gets really thrown off or I'll go six, seven, eight, nine, ten days at a stretch without really getting any time off. And all of a sudden my body just says, hey, we're done. And I fall asleep on Friday, wake up on Monday morning and go, what the hell just happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I do the same thing. I'm kind of a crash and burn type of person um, after so long. But I, I feel fine for a while. But anyways, I was just going to say, like, it's kind of funny. I'll, I'll uh, have people and they're like, what are you doing up? And first of all, it's kind of annoying because I'm like, why is it your business? Like, why? what is it your business? Whatever. And and friends of ours, whatever. I'm just talking about random people on Twitter. And uh, and I'm like, well, uh, this is kind of how my life has lived. So um, you won't see me on very often at 7 or 8 a.m. Um, you will see me on at 2 a.m. So... <laughs> Yeah. No. Actually, you'll see me on at seven and stuff too. Actually, I just usually refrain from morning Twitter, even if I am up. So, and I am because I have a four year old. So he, he's, I'm lucky if he sleeps till 8 30. And like this morning, he slept till 10. And I woke up startled, like ran in there at like nine, thought he was dead. And then he was fine. And then he slept till 10. <laughs> well, I don't, I honestly kind of avoid main TL Twitter anymore most of the time, unless. Unless Trump has tweeted something that I can make fun of people for, <laughs> which has happened over the last couple of days, so that was that was fun. Um, so, but yeah, I, I guess we might as well talk about that only because you know it's kind of the thing everybody's been talking about. And I will admit, it made Trump sound like a fifth grader. I laughed my ass off, but it made Trump sound like a fifth grader. <laughs> yeah, like a lot of his tweets, but. I mean, I think the outrage over it, like it's going to actually start some sort of nuclear conflict. It's not what I would have done. Uh, I don't think it inspires much confidence in your in your seriousness and maturity on a very, very volatile subject as the president of the free world, as, as the leader of the free world. But um, I also don't think that it means World War Three is starting. So... Yeah, I decided since I couldn't do a show last night because I had um, actually I missed work yesterday because I didn't feel well and then I wasn't feeling that well by six. And I was like, you know what, if if I miss regular work and then the folks that I work with tune in and hear me 
goofing off on the radio, they're probably going to be a little cranky because they all know that I do it now. So it's not like I can hide it. Um, and honestly, I'd started having a coughing fit. So I was like, hey, I'm going to take some more medicine and just produce for G. But I decided to give the Splody Heads yesterday some homework. And I told them, you know, for all you leftists that are like melting down right now, I would like for you to grab your phone and text uh, this, sta- this sta- statement a hundred times before tomorrow's show. The president cannot declare war via Twitter because he can't. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I do understand that it could exacerbate an issue. And we have no idea. Honestly, we have no idea the true temperament of Kim Jong-un, right? Like we we joke about it and like we act like he's some kind of like blubbering idiot too. And and, uh, who is completely egotistical and narcissistic and would get mad at the drop of a hat. But other than some relayed info about people that he has possibly punished because they wronged him we don't quite know as much as we pretend to about this and so i get that that's part of the fear of some people in um kind of poking the bear there because you just don't really know what his reaction might be but at the same time like to pretend like every little word trump says is going to make him push that nuclear button is also pretty hair on fire silly I, I mean, if, if if we're poking the bear, are we poking him in his belly? Just <laughs> I'm uh, so I don't want to know where we're poking lonely. anything, honestly. I just thought maybe that's where his <laughs> button was, was in his belly. You know, I don't know. All right. So, you know, and, and I, have, I have to say this only because it really, really disturbed me. So somebody put out a tweet. And I don't know who in the heck put it put it together, but it was kind of gross. So it shows Donald Trump and Kim Jong Un sitting next to each other, with rockets called the button, and one of them is bigger than the other one, and they're each touching their own rockets. The hell's yeah. the matter with you people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, rockets in place of ding dongs. It's uh, it's a little gross. What the hell's the matter with you people? <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I can't decide if it's like a liberal or a conservative troll that made it. <laughs> I'm not really sure, but they make me kind of feel a bit like this. I hate this place. Just saying. Yeah. It's just definitely. I, yeah, but, yeah. It's, so, but you know, to now one other thing that I kind of want to get into, and then we'll just keep going with you know news of the day. I have to say this only because it's one of the few times that I feel I'll be able to say this, and it's actually warranted. Mr. Trump, I tried to tell you about Bannon. Just saying. Dummy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so I fill me in a little bit because I keep seeing people scream about him a little bit, but I haven't had quite enough time to dive into what the latest the latest is. So Trump's decided that when Bannon got fired, not only did he lose his job, he's lost his mind. He's um, given out all kinds of excerpts for this book that's coming out tomorrow. The president's mm-hmm. attorneys are so disturbed by the book that's coming out tomorrow, they've accused him of violating his uh, non-disclosure agreement and have filed a cease and desist, but the book's still going out anyway. My point is Donald Trump keeps telling everybody that everything that Bannon says isn't true. Then how did he violate an NDA if what he's saying is not true? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, it wouldn't be a violation, but I did see someone else say something about a um, uh, that it was more of the concern of, you know, defamation and that there were things in there that weren't true, of course, and then that would be spreading rumors and lies or whatever. So I would understand on that front. But if he's claiming that he violated an NDA, that means some of what's in there is true and he is exposing it, which would make See, big orange guy mad. That's part of what worries me because I'm just thinking, you know, you can't really accuse him of violating a non-disclosure agreement unless some of what he's saying is truthful. Now, they're not talking about what parts of it may be truthful, so maybe he's just, you know, some things in there that they don't want released that aren't necessarily the damning parts. But right. now, of That's course... What, that, yeah, I would think that that could be easily the case, just stuff that you wouldn't want out there but that isn't really anything, uh, you know, nothing prosecutable, surely, and, and or anything of that nature. And, I mean, you never know, but... The point that I've been making all day and would have made more of if I hadn't accidentally left my phone at home and couldn't do any promotion or anything today because I didn't have my phone um, was the fact that, you know, we were some of the loudest people screaming that 
Donald Trump had no idea who he was climbing into bed with when he decided to get involved with Mr. Bannon, who is a self-proclaimed yes. Leninist and is not a conservative and blatantly admits to using the Tea Party until he basically got it to kill itself. Yes. Uh, he's what I would call an unsavory character, um, not to be trusted and not really to be, um, to, not to partner with. And, you know, Trump kind of put his eggs in those baskets and uh, defied everybody who warned him. And, you know, it, it ended up on on the bad side here. You know, they tried to play nice and make it like it wasn't a bad exit. And we all knew it was, um, but they did try to cover that up for a while. Uh, obviously, this book is going to expose that it was not. But um, I also want to say, though, that like I'm not real fond of the president or the press secretary or the president via the press secretary um, implying that a private citizen should be fired from a private business because he has wronged the president in some personal way and that uh, unless he did something that actually like violated some sort of law, which it doesn't seem that that's the case here. Uh, I'm, I'm not real keen, no matter if it's Bannon or anybody else, I'm not real keen on, um, you know, just like I wasn't during all the kneeling and protests and he's like, this person should be fired. This person shouldn't get a starting job. This person shouldn't this and that. Uh, I, I'm not big on the president using his platform to talk about whether or not a private citizen should keep their job just because the president doesn't like them. No, I agree. Now, I have actually seen rumblings now that because of all the weird crap that's going on with Bannon that his job in at Breitbart may actually be in jeopardy. Um, honestly... Here's my problem with Breitbart. Here's my problem with Breitbart. It should have been in jeopardy long ago. When he when he basically tied Breitbart uh, to the alt right and made it the laughing stock of conservative media, that's when Bannon should have been booted. But instead, you know, they've defended, they've held on, they've bootlicked for Trump, and uh, and now it's getting a little bit sticky, especially with the rumors of Bannon having. Oh, possibly been involved in some domestic violence and some other things. I mean, it's just, it's kind of like, for me, it's too little, too late, boys. Yeah, you know, and that that's thats the thing that I guess, um, that, well, that's actually pretty much what I was about to say is to me, it's too little, too late. Um, and I'm, I mentioned some of this on Off the Rails, so I'm not going to go into it today. But one of the things are too much on here. But one of the things that made me really, really sad was by the time I started running in some of the same circles that um, Andrew Breitbart was running in, he had already passed. He sounds like somebody that I would have really liked to have gotten to know. Um, mm -hmm. However, I can tell you that it's probably a good thing for all of us that I never really got to know him very well because... I'm somebody that once I get to know somebody, if we talk and we interact a lot, I start to consider them friends. And I probably would have gone to jail for what Bannon has done to Breitbart if I had known Andrew. So it's probably in my best interest that we never got to know each other. <laughs> you know, there are quite a few people that were, um, if not if not close, at least decent friends with Andrew that um, have talked about the struggle of, of that, of watching his baby go down. And uh, that's really sad. I feel like that's that's such a um, such a hard thing for family and friends to watch uh, someone's legacy get taken in in such a direction that you know would not have been what they wanted. And uh, well, I guess the worst thing for me about that is I've seen it happen all too often. Like, I mean, I used to work for Southwest Airlines back in the day. When I initially started working for Southwest Airlines, everything was still being run a lot like the founder of Southwest Airlines has, had intended. Within my first two years of being there, everything changed because they had a new CEO. Uh, Herb Kelleher was no longer anywhere involved in the situation. The CEO that took his place was out. They had a new one. And so it was just, you know, you saw this company that really everybody felt like it was a family. And now all of a sudden it's, you know, you're basically you're getting yelled at for not trying to upsell someone who's crying and in tears and has to find a flight. Our most expensive ticket because of the 
easy, easy and convenient things that it offers them when it's $40 higher than a regular fare ticket. And they're already telling you they don't have the money for the regular fare ticket, but they have a funeral they weren't expecting to go to. That's why I left, because I got tired of, you know, during my coaching sessions, they're like, well, we listened to this call. And this should have been a, this was an opportunity for you to sell the business select fair, and you chose not to do that. That's not acceptable. So, did you hear the lady on the phone who was crying and was already yeah. already in tears because she didn't have four hundred and seventy five dollars for a round trip ticket, but you wanted me to offer a ticket for five hundred and twenty five dollars just because it gave her priority boarding and a free drink? No, not something she cared about. No. And But see, that's the thing. When I took the job, that was one of the reasons why I left the company that I was with to go there. Because during the interview, I specifically asked them, are there any sales requirements for this job? And they're like, no. Our job, first and foremost, is customer service. We want you to make sure that the customers are getting what they want when they interact with you on the phone. And that's how it was when I started. But then they started, well, you need to upsell this. We're going to start offering our credit cards on every call. We're going to start offering hotels and rental cars from our partners on every single call. And I'm like, no, I'm not, because there are certain calls where that's not warranted. They're like, well, if you can't do that, then it's time for you to start finding some more work. So I did. Because to me, the, wow. cu- the customer was more important than trying to pad more money. I mean, I understand the airline business has been in trouble for a while, and I get it. And Southwest was one of the ones, whether anybody realizes it or not, that was one of the hardest ones hit. But when you start talking about adding extra time for the amount of time that we have to be on the phone in the first place, which is which is already really expensive, to the fact that we were making people that were already, in some cases, frustrated because they were having to reschedule a flight and weren't planning on it, but now we're trying to sell them extra crap on top of it, even though they were already mad about rescheduling a flight, or they've had a death in the family, or all these things. These are th- These are the things that have been killing America businesses is the fact that we've had boardrooms in charge of the bottom line for too long instead of actual people that built the damn thing. And that's that's what I'm talking about with Breitbart. That's what happened when Andrew left. Somebody saw a chance to make money off of it and then it just slowly became what it is now. And now it's basically it went from one of the top rated conservative news sites in the country to oh my god, stay away from that. It's a bunch of all right crazy people. I'm I'm honestly glad I never got to know Andrew or that would really be painful for me to have seen. I don't even I never even got to meet him and just hearing other people talk about it and how well they knew him and how much they knew that he had labored to make right part what it was. What is enough to just make me just want to just go nuts because I've been there. I've built a business from from nothing and had it fall apart. I've been through that. I know how much it sucks. I know how much it sucks when you're, well, this is something that I'm going to be able to leave for my kids, and it's gone. Yeah, and I think that with Breitbart, um, you know, I I still feel bad for, there are still some uh, writers there that are good, solid, reputable people. And um, it sucks, and and they have been on for a long time, um, and they knew Andrew, and it sucks that 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 it's come to that uh, for them and uh, whether they have decided to find new work or, or are sticking with it to hope it gets better. But um, there are a few that left and there are a few that are still there. And uh, I feel bad for them too, because they are also still just trying to do what they want to do, what they, what they love, what they're good at. And their friend and their former employer. And so that's a tough spot to be in. No, I mean, it it most definitely is. All right, so at this point, we've about hit the bottom of the hour. Actually, with the late start, we're a little bit over. So we're going to go ahead and take a really quick break. This is, I almost did it again. This is Jen and Rick. We'll be back in about three minutes. Now that I I managed to not say the wrong show name for once. We'll be right back. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, 
Think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible, affordable, relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. Welcome back, folks. This is Jen and Rick on KLRNRadio.com. We are live with you here just through the bottom of the hour. Um, actually, we're going to change topics a bit. Um, one of the things I thought we could talk about is Bernie Sanders apparently decided to step in it again today. Um, he put out a tweet today talking about all of these millionaires that are sad that their taxes are going down instead of going up. Um, Twitter responded by pointing out that there's a link where they can actually go and basically give money to the federal government. And it's not like when you check the little box on your W-4 and eventually they try to give it back to you at the end of the year. No, this is actually a fis- what they call a fiscal gift to the U.S. government. And it's basically if you want to give them money to pay down the national debt, they will take it from you. So for all of you liberal millionaires, the few of you that there are that haven't gotten rich off of the federal government, that is – um, that want to give your money away, feel free. Leave the rest of us the hell alone. <laughs> I mean, exactly. Uh, so actually where you where you go is fiscal.treasury.gov. Um, and then there will be a link on the right there that says uh, make a gift to the U.S. government. And that brings you up to a page that says how you do it. Um, general gifts. Uh, there, there's a few different options there, but it has an actual page on on the um, Treasury website. So please feel free to go and drop all your money there that you would like to get rid of. Um, yeah, Bernie put out. Mr. Trump, listen to these patriotic who want their taxes raised, not cut. And it was the mortgage work of people. Honestly, a lot of them look kind of like creepsters, but maybe I'm just a little bit um biased against people that are wanting to give their money to the government. And I like what a couple other people said was like, you know, they can give that to charity if they if they just are so burdened by their millions, um, then why why not give them to give that money to charities or causes, you know, worth having it. 
And uh, some responses were, well, but don't you know, like the government can do better. Like the government is the only one to trust with that kind of money. The government is the one who will better use that money, you know, because that, that is how a lot of leftists think. And uh, so, like I said, if that is true, feel free to go to fiscal.treasury.gov. Give all your money. We don't care. Leave us alone. Yeah. In fact, if they would all go donate, like some of them were like, what am I going to do with 20 extra million a year? So if all of them would go donate 20 extra million every year, we could either A, have the rest of citizens not pay taxes or B, pay down the debt. Yeah, exactly. You, th you, think, you think that could happen? You know they're not going to do it. I mean, think about it. <laughs> the, so, the socialist guy who's telling us what we should do with our money owns three houses. <laughs> oh, I know. It's it's utterly ridiculous. While, I, while his I wife mean, is facing charges for mishandling money. <laughs> I mean, it's just, ugh, it's so absurd and so stupid. But yeah, so I thought that would be a, a fun story to at least bring up for a moment. Because yeah, yeah, so for all of you that have these liberal floaty head friends that are like, oh my God, they're going to kill us with these tax breaks and we're not going to get anything anyway. The next one that tells you $40 isn't much money, give them that link and tell them to give it back. Right. And I actually have had some people in real life that have told me like, you know, and like we could be doing more for the poor and this and that. And I'm like, yeah, what? Well, I mean, people could pay more. And I'm like, okay, so do you think you make enough that you could pay more? And these are people that I know that have good jobs. I mean, they have two cars and, you know, a media room and three TVs. And a lot of them don't have kids yet or anything. And um, both them and their spouses work and they both get paid uh, really well by most people's standards and um they have owned at least two homes already and i'm not talking about it at the same time but i mean they they've owned a starter home and they're on to their next one and they're not even 35. so do you think you make enough money that more should be taken from you is that the case and most and a few of them will answer and say yeah yeah i should be in a little i should get a little bit more taken and i'm like okay so where would why don't you just go ahead and take whatever percent that you think should be taken from you and go ahead and write that check and they've gone well but then i don't know where it's going i go you think that with the way that they take it from you now you get to dictate where it goes well yeah i mean because you know this amount this goes to social security and this goes to medicare and this goes no 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 honey okay yeah theoretically this is taken out for that and it goes to that little section of the treasury but um in all reality, you have no control over your tax money. You have no control over where it goes and how it is spent, which is, of course, of course, the most important and how we're in the big trouble that we are with this, you know, out of control bureaucracies. So um, they always balk once I say that because they can't be sure. And I'm like, OK, well, then fine. Let's just do this. Then take that extra percentage and you donate it to whatever you're passionate about, be it cancer research or uh, you know, pet adoption or anything like that. Well, I already donate to things like that. Well, okay, but those are real life things that benefit real life people um, and more directly impact them than any money that you give to the government. So uh, then donate a little bit more or find a couple new causes to give to. Otherwise, I don't really want to hear it. You know, but but that's the thing. These people honestly think that the, because I I guess because they I don't know where they get the idea from, but it's like they think that when they check the box or when their tax money, it's like they seem to think they're filling out something on their taxes that tells them where they want their tax money to go. Trust me, if I could tell people where my tax money needed to go, the well, the one place that I would check that it definitely need, didn't need it to go was to pay for shrimp on, shrimp on treadmill or a um, compressed natural gas gas station in Afghanistan where they don't even have compressed natural gas. Cars. Cars. Uh, I mean, absolutely. There are so many things that our tax money goes to that people would be appalled if they looked at the laundry list. And there are some places where you can see some of the lists of, of just some of the money spent and it will just make anyone go crazy. But, you know, I have respect for people that think that way and then they do something about it on their own like i've got a couple college friends um some people them and some acquaintances that they are very left-leaning and um 
truly think that we don't do enough uh, for poor people, for homelessness, um, for those with mental health issues that end up, you know, uh, addicted and on the streets and all of those things, and uh, that they they aren't eating well and that they don't have the opportunity to eat well and that the government's not doing enough to help them. So what did they do? They went around and organized with several hundred local restaurants and uh, stores and bakeries and all of these types of places. And they started a program called Keep Austin Fed. And they run around and they get um, the, the waste that basically the stuff that restaurants are going to get rid of or the stuff that's about to go bad that won't be used in time. And they have put together a food kitchen and they go around and collect all of this and they have been able to feed hundreds of thousands of more people than the government has ever been able to in the city of Austin. So I have respect for people like that that go and put their money where their mouth is. So do something to turn it around if you're so worried about certain things. You have that capability. If you are if you think you have the money to just be taxed more, then you have the capability to start programs like that that will truly affect your community and truly benefit private citizens. Yeah, no, and those those are the people that I respect. So the people that see something that's broken and then they find a way to take care of it and they get it done. Those are the people that I'm talking about. Those, those are the type of people that we need. What we don't need are these people that don't want to do anything but sit on their couch and go, ah, I don't need to do anything. The government's got my tax money and it'll go, it'll go to help the poor and it'll go to help the homeless and it'll go to help the needy. No, actually, most of it won't. That's the problem. That's, that's why right. those of us that, that look into this and that, that do actually research and they're like, you don't have any idea where your tax money goes or how much of it gets wasted. Speaking of which, we didn't do that for this last year. So I do, I, I did actually see that uh, Langford had put his report out. So I'm going to go over that this weekend and probably start getting stuff put together for next week because we haven't done the waste and abuse thing for 2017. We did yeah, it. yeah, we let's did do it. that. We did it for 16 because that's when I was like yelling for like 20 minutes about the compressed natural gas gas station <laughs> in <laughs> Afghanistan where they don't even have those type of cars available. Go figure. Um, but okay, so one other thing I wanted to talk about real quick, um, and then we can kind of go wherever. Um, this actually was given to me today by station manager, and she found it on a site that had it behind a paywall. And she's like, this is one of the sites that I subscribe to, and I knew you couldn't get to it, so here you go. So apparently, the uh, the White House chief of staff is banning cell phones in the West Wing. You know, I have to be honest. I am kind of surprised this uh isn't already a thing me too i mean when you stop and think about it i mean because and that's kind of what the article kind of goes into is you know pretty much every other dod facility or any other time there's any type of classified information available which let's face it the west wing is crawling with classified information there's already a compartmentalized thing where either you have to leave the, the your phone in your own personal vehicle or there's a box that you have basically have to check it into before you go to go into a certain room or a certain part of the facility and those things are already commonplace pretty much everywhere but the west wing and just think, if we'd have had this in place, all these leaks that everybody's been talking about would have been a lot fewer and farther between, for one. Right. And so what I know is that uh, what I had a friend that worked in the governor's office in Texas is pretty high up. And um, and one thing that would happen with them is that so he was very close to the governor. And so he had to have his cell phone because he was helping coordinate things with the governor all the time. But there were a lot of administrative staff that were not allowed to have theirs. And they basically had, do you all remember PDAs, like personal device assistants, Palm Pilots? Yeah, things it, that's a brand. But I mean, everyone kind of can remember a Palm Pilot that's uh, under or over the age of 30. So um, they basically are all issued a basic PDA so that it keeps the calendar, it sends notifications, they can do email within the server, so only the people that they need to in those situations that they need to be mobile. And then, um, you know, and then it keeps a few other things, but it doesn't take pictures, um, it doesn't allow for texting or anything like that, communication with the outside, phone calls, any of those things. So they can still keep stuff organized and they can download that, whatever they have taken in those meetings, and they can put it 
for what they need to later, um, but it all has to go through the server so it all gets approved. Um, and so that's what they did in the, the governor's office in Texas for at least some of the staff. So it really kind of surprises me that, and they, that this isn't already more of a thing in the West Wing. And well, I mean, the thing about it is apparently he's been trying to get this done now for like a year and they've been pushing off on it and pushing off on it and pushing off on it. And he's finally just decided, you know, now's the time that it, the ban goes into effect. And apparently most of the people that are the most upset about it are the media. Wonder why. <laughs> oh, well, duh. and I'm sure they're going to call for some like freedom of press issues. Um, I'm, I have no doubt that that's going to be not far behind here. I don't know. To me, I, like I said, to me, it was just kind of entertaining. I mean, I'm just going to kind of peruse it a bit because I read through almost the whole thing on the other show. Um, staffers and guests are bracing for a change in policy that will ban personal cell phone use in the West Wing. The ban imposed by Chief of Staff John Kelly, a former Marine general, likely stems from his own experience with security practices that are widely enforced at U.S. military bases around the world. Within the Department of Defense, personal communication devices are not permitted in areas where secret or top secret information is stored or transmitted. This often includes entire buildings not just certain rooms within a building also let this sink in for just a second if they had a policy kind of like this you know maybe not only in the west wing but also in the secretary of state's office how much less trouble would hillary clinton be in right now the same i mean not that she's really oh, in any trouble how over much, it, but you know <laughs> how much how much less trouble would so many people have been in over the years i mean I feel like this is there have been all kinds of little things that have popped up um, that have come from people's cell phones. So, yeah, just seems like a not too not too bad of a policy. Well, I mean, it's one of those things where honestly, technology has gotten to the point where it's outraced common sense. I mean, because people be, I mean, and people don't really think about it because they take them for granted. But you have a computer in your pocket. That And then one of the things that this article goes on to talk about is, you know, even if you have your cell phone off and with the battery still in it, a hacker can access that device because it's still getting a signal even when it's off because it has a battery in it. And they can actually c turn your phone into a listening device without your permission or any intent or you knowing that it's happening. That can happen because... Yeah... I mean that that's I mean you know that that's something that would have seemed like seemed like ten foil hat talk ten years ago, and we've seen it happen now more and more and more. I mean that's like everybody. I mean like when I when I worked for Convergus, one of the soup calls that I took as a team lead was somebody making a joke that went over poorly. Um, it was uh, she basically this was a customer, and she was you know having a bit of a hard time about something. And this guy, for some reason, thought this was going to be really funny because she was one of these people that was paranoid that, you know, the box is watching her. Well, why do I even have this thing in my house? Why can't I just get into the back of my TV? I know people are watching me through this. And he's like, man, that's a lovely green dress you have on. Trying to convince her that we're not watching her. She had a green dress on. <laughs> Yowzas. And that would that was an actual soup call that I took once I became a team leader when we got moved back to the tech department. Before then, and I had heard this kind of a story before, but I'd never had to deal with it firsthand before. I mean, that was one of the things they talked about in training was a similar situation, except it was a guy wearing a red hat who completely got freaked out because the guy said, "Ah, hey, nice red hat." It's like, see, we're not watching you. What? You, I'm wearing a red hat. I want to talk to your soup. Oh, I want this stuff. Boy. I want this stuff out of my house, and I want it out of my house now. But, I mean, that, that's the kind of things that we used to be paranoid about. But turns out those things are a lot more common than we think now because e everything has a camera on it. Everything has a mm, microphone I know. on it. And that's one of the reasons why they just it, it's really a good idea that if you're going to be somewhere where there's top secret or classified information, that you don't have a computer in your pocket. Duh. Just saying. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Hey, by the way, Trump just tweeted. Oh, God. You want to hear it? What did he do now? 
I authorized zero access to White House. Actually turned him down many times for author of phony book. I never spoke to him for a book full of lies, misrepresentations, and sources that don't exist. Look at this guy's past and watch what happens to him and sloppy Steve. Good God, someone needs to take that man's phone away. <laughs> Sloppy Steve. <laughs> I think the nicknames are what just make me laugh about everything now. Oh, I'm like, oh gosh, what nickname is Trump going to come up with for someone next? Sloppy Steve, that's who. <laughs> Look at this guy's past and watch what happens to him and Sloppy Steve. Oh man! Oh my God! Did you? I mean, seriously? I mean, I, he's. See, I, I, just, I don't know what to think about it anymore because every time I think he's made things worse, eventually six months down the road, everybody else has egg on their face and he's standing there smiling like a moron. I just, I don't under, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't either. But uh, so I'm thinking I should get this book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking I might want to read it too, just so I can you know see what all the fuss is about. I mean, seriously, I'm sure there are going to be some people posting tons of excerpts, uh, so that will be cool. But I don't know. I'm very interested. Maybe a um, maybe a special edition live reading uh, might be in order because <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be ridiculous. Yeah, I just I don't. It's just. I'm, I don't know what to say. <laughs> was I, I guess until we see parts of it, it won't be understood whether it's like really obviously super fabricated or if it seems like, well, I mean, I'm not talking about we as a collective, uh, you know, people of the United States, because all of the leftists will believe every word. I mean, they really think that Trump went around and urinated on Russian hookers and all sorts of things like that. So, um, you know that they will believe every bit of it, even if it means that uh, it says that he, you know, slit someone's throat in the middle of the oval and then proceeded to do dirty acts on the body. I mean, they'll be like, "Of course he did! I told you he's Satan." But um, the, those of us that are a little bit more uh, that retain a little bit more of our sanity might be able to to cipher through it a little bit and see if there's. Maybe uh, if it's really off the charts or if it's maybe there's some validity to it. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of speechless over that one. I still can't really get over the sloppy Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it's so funny to me, but it is. <laughs> I, just, it, I think I'm kind of with you. The funky nicknames are kind of what just kind of makes me just like, oh, my God. Well, yeah, that's what makes it very, like, childish, right? But I also, it's kind of what I enjoy the most about it now. Now that I'm not so, like, oh, put out about him being president. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I didn't want him. I still don't want him. But, you know, whatever. There's, there's, I think it could be worse personally. So, um and and I think I've just gotten a little desensitized to all of his kind of attention whoring in this way. So now these childish nicknames and phrases and everything, they actually just make me laugh and I find them entertaining. I think that's part of it for me is I just, I really, I don't, I, I guess I've just kind of gotten used to the fact that he's a moron on Twitter. Mm -hmm. but, but I mean, again, to me, and, you know, I talked about this in one of the groups that we were in. One of the things that I honestly think he's starting to do, and I didn't really think about it until I went back and kind of reviewed a conversation that I had had with someone who was treating me like a moron until I proved to them that I wasn't. I have a habit of allowing people to underestimate me, and I typically do that on purpose. I've done it when I was a private investigator. I do it sometimes in conversations on Twitter because I will allow people to let their own preconceived notions feed what they're going to say to me and then basically just turn it all back around on them before they realize what's happened. Um, and in some ways, I honestly think that's what he's been doing for about the last two years because he knows that pretty much all of these people that used to pretend to be his friends now can't stand him. 
and he acts the way that they expect him to act because it feeds their inability to not talk about him, which boosts his ego. And then he's got them distracted talking about all the crazy things that he's either done or said over the years. And he's over here just, I mean, with all this positive news that nobody's talking about because they're too busy talking about what a moron that he is. And I don't know what's going to happen with this book. And it's the same thing that I've told everybody from the beginning. If you bring me some credible proof that this administration has done something illegal regarding the Russians without using the phrase collusion, because let's not forget, in most circles, other than one specific instance, collusion is not actually a crime. In the instance and the thing that we're talking about, even if there is collusion, it's not necessarily a crime. And I have another question. If it's so illegal for a candidate to meet with foreign officials, why was candidate Obama doing it all the time? And why did nobody say anything then? Well, I mean, it was Obama. Yeah, I mean, you probably have a point there. I, I mean, I don't even know that we have to go any further than, mm, but Obama. It was Obama. King Barack Obama himself. The anointed one. Which is why it's so funny to me that so many people on the right have fallen for Trump being the anointed one because it's just two sides of a different, I mean, you know, two sides of the same coin and ugh, gosh, can we not do the idol worship again? That was so obnoxious with Obama. Yeah, well, and that was one of the things that I didn't want in the first place was, and that's one of the things that caused me to, to push against him so hard was the fact that we were basically becoming, you know, two sides of the same coin. And in a lot of ways we have. But, I mean, and even the people that are calling me a Trump sycophant now don't realize that I still uh, criticize him when he deserves criticizing. But at the same time, I mean, you know, econo e economy-wise, he's actually done a pretty good job. You can argue, you know, like I see a lot of people do, that maybe most of the stuff was already in the works from Obama. But I really don't believe that because Obama had eight years and we never got anywhere near 2% GDP. You know, this guy. This guy's in office for a year, and all of a sudden we've hit two. Well, now we're headed towards three quarters of three percent. Everybody thought we were never going to see those numbers again. A lot of that is because of consumer confidence. I mean, the the holiday season set sales records like we haven't seen in decades because of consumer confidence. So while everybody's telling us how afraid of the the of Trump all of America is, all the numbers seem to say otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. All right, well, just for the fun of it, I was going to try to play that parody that they put together a long time ago from when he was tweeting, and I think I may have just found it, maybe. Yep, I think I did. Um, Trumpster's Paradise, you remember that one? <laughs> oh, yes, it's one of my faves. I was going to run that on the way out, and I couldn't find it, but right as I was about to give up, I found it. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and close now, I think, and then we're going to run this on the way out in honor of the fact that President Trump is tweeting again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't you remind folks where it is that they can hang out with you when you're not on the radio hanging out with me? Yes, come find me on Twitter at Jay Homestead and Facebook JR Homestead. I'm over at MisfitsPolitics.com. Tomorrow night is Misfit Mischief, so be there, don't be square. Woohoo! I actually will be home, so I might actually get to partake in this one a bit. All right, so on that note, folks, I am Rick Robinson. We're out for the night. I will be back with you tomorrow night. First of, first of all, for the Friday edition of America Off the Rails. Um, this was a really short week in between holidays and me being sick and family stuff, so we only did tonight and tomorrow night. But things should return to normal next week. And then, of course, I'll be back for Robinson and Wright, provided Dan doesn't have to work late and nobody has sick kids, because that's what ran in, we ran into last week. So we will see. But on that note, folks, we are out. In honor of the fact that the president keeps making people's heads explode via Twitter, we're going to play a nice little song called Trumpster's Paradise. I'm pretty sure this is the one where they talk about tweeting, I think. It may not be, but either way, it's a good one. So we're on the way out, folks. Good night.
actually, I was wrong. This isn't the one I was looking for, but it's still a good one, so we're going to run it. I took a look at the right and agonized the fuck the left, because they've been cashing and papping so long that even the buck you think that this party is gone. But they never lost a plan where they want the servant. We be beating like a drunk sovereign TV and turd love. We never watch how they stalking and interlocking. It's true with the status they be trying to walk. A calculated quip, but you gotta know System's broke, Obamacare ain't gonna go Fool, he's the kind of be the little status Wanna be like saying please to the right Principles ain't your birthright Ben Yen was so proud Living in a Trump's ass This administration, they all but making the press lose their effing minds, getting hazed by the tweet, but they always be clowning the mainstream. Too much imprecision, botching, and apparent schemes. They be preferential fools with agenda on their mind. The PADNC gotta be demonized. He provoked pure anchor, a plus pimping canker, but his cronies abound, and they ain't just your average tool. But the press keeps breaking a scandal a day, misgiving strife amplifying, can't brush away. He's in the seat now, but will he stay to be a soft for the way he be tweeting? I don't know. Tell me why must we on the damn TV watch the POTUS deserve common decency? Been getting most of the crime, living in a Trump's death paradise. Planned parenthood that's tied, living in a Trump's death paradise. And the Comey, Gucci got devoured. People making exits used to have some power. Little what he's saying, about half of what he's doing. A marathon of fiction, but some of us be looking. Some say I got a spur, and others get on both knees. But they just be that standing. Decision is just me. Some trope I can, some trope I won't. Most pundits suck, they be always baiting and clicking for the press pool. Baby.